Oh, good afternoon. And praise the Lord. Uh, first of all, let me say a very warm welcome to those of you who are entering students. Now, I do know that some do not consider this a very significant occasion, but it is. And uh, whether you stand up or not, or whether you come here or not, you are bound by what is being said. And so it does not really change anything in terms of the obligations of a student, just like it doesn't change the obligations that we carry in academia and in administration. But I want to welcome you, all of you who are entering students, and we are glad to have you on this day uh, as we have inducted you. And now it is my singular opportunity to be able to share with you God's word. But before I do that, I think it's important. Sometimes we don't do these things, and I know time is against me, but uh, we don't introduce many of these people, and you don't get to know them, and yet you are being inducted. So can I ask the, just to stand up, uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs, Dr. John Mulindwa Chitaimwa, over there. Uh, then we do have the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Finance and Administration, Mr. David Mugawe. Uh, we do have, uh, we, we got a, a mercenary to read for social sciences, uh, Professor Monica Chivita, but she's, uh, she's substantively the Dean of this, uh, the Faculty of Journalism, Media and Communications. And uh, we are glad today, actually, to have the Dean for the UCU School of Medicine. He spends more time on the other side, uh, Dr. Ned Kanyesije. We are very glad to have you here. Then we do have Dr. Richard Watulo, Dean, Faculty of Education. Now, the chaplain may actually pout if I don't introduce him. So, Reverend Engineer Paul Waswa, please. And together with Reverend Lovisa. Uh, we are so glad. I know some of the other deans are out there. The deans who are seated out there, can you kindly stand up? If there are any deans seated out there, Professor Biaruhanga, yes. Uh, Professor Bachwayo, Professor Elizabeth Chizito. Elizabeth Bachwayo and Elizabeth Chizito. So we have two queens in this country. Queen Elizabeth and Queen Elizabeth. Okay. Let's pray. Blessed Father, thank you so much for this time. Every moment that we meet with you is special. And sometimes we may forget how significant it is in our own lives to come before you. But you have been pleased that your word would also be written. And we thank you because from your word we do receive instruction. And we get to know you better. It's my plea and cry, Lord, that you will fulfill your purposes this afternoon in our lives. Speak to me so that you may speak through me. And help me to decrease that only you will increase. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, as students who are coming in new, although the message is relevant for everybody... I did choose my, top, my topic coming out of this text we read, which is Psalm 1, to be choose your influencers. Choose those that will influence you. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. You know, the years of youth can be most impressionable. I've seen it with my children as they've grown. All of them now are adults, some married. But they can be very impressionable and life-changing for the rest of your life, particularly university life. I have even read psychologists, actually, who refer to this age, uh, the same age you are at in university, as an age of defining your values and your ideologies, in other words, what you believe in. And I think there is some truth to that. If you look around and you try to study a little bit, you get to understand that most inventors became inventors during the age of the early 20s. That's very interesting, isn't it? I know you are, for you, you are mostly familiar with Facebook. 
Okay, the Facebook people were actually in university. They were like you. So in every way, your values and your ideologies tend to be formed and you are asking many questions as you are at university, as you should actually. It should not surprise you that politicians like coming into universities. I think the president in Uganda who did that best was Milton Obote, who really made Makere his catchment area for the UPC. He knew, he understood that at that age, those young people, once they commit themselves to an ideology, they will keep with it. So he wanted to influence them. That's the same thing, by the way, with the religious convictions. Religious convictions. I cannot remember a time that was as formative for me as university time when I came to Christ in my first year. And for the rest of the years, the way that God spoke to me, changed me, turned around my life to be completely different. When I entered university, I had different aspirations. By the time I completed, I had changed. And in fact, it was at that moment that I decided that I was going to go into uh, ministry. Although I had a very good degree under my armpit, I still wanted to go into ministry. Career. You know, sometimes I've even had parents come to me. And the parents are saying, but in our family we only have doctors and we only have engineers and we only... And the young person says, for me, I want to do this. And they shock their parents. Because you see, they are thinking through what am I going to be. This is, and that's a very important stage in your life. Okay? It's a very important stage in your life. And all sorts of lifetime commitments. When you are in university, if you're not married, <laughs> that's when you start saying, now, these things I've been feeling, shouldn't I be getting someone? That's university. University does that. And I remember going through those experiences. And I was thinking to myself, because I was at the University of Nairobi, should I marry someone from here? And there were some very beautiful Kikuyus, beautiful Kalenjin, beautiful whatever. It's no more. At this moment, you are actually thinking through a lot. Things that are going to form your future. But may I say also, and I could go on and on with the different things, it is also a hazardous journey. It is also a hazardous journey. When the youth may make decisions that will scar their life for good. It is also a hazardous journey. It should not surprise you that around the university, anywhere you put a university in Uganda, what are some of the people that come around the universities, nightclubs, bars, prostitutes, and things like that? It's also hazardous. It is also the time, it's not only God that wants to catch your heart, but the devil is also very busy trying to catch your heart. So you get into all these disastrous things and then you regret later. Just keep in mind that the life you're living at university is very formative for you in terms of the life that you live hereafter. So it becomes important then that while at university we should try to preempt the choices that you make. And hence comes in the whole idea of influencers. You'll get influences from the good side. You'll get influence from the godless side. But you can also get influences from the devil. Uh, my devotion this morning, Jesus called Judas Iscariot a devil. So you can actually get influences also coming from that side. And so you need to be very careful. This is why it is important to preempt and choose your own influencers in this university. And don't deceive yourself about, about being a Christian university. It does not mean that when you are in a Christian university, you will not get wrong influencers. Right? That's the mistake quite often that is made. 
Now, there are a couple of things that I think the psalmist brings out for us. One is cold company. And the second one is just food for your heart and your mind. Paul says, do not be deceived. Bad company spoils good morals. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Bad company spoils good morals. Because he's concerned, just like, as we, just like we should be, that the company that you keep will define the life that you live. You did not have the opportunity to choose your family, did you? At least I didn't. Maybe some of you did. The only one that I know, eh, whoever chose the family to be born in is Jesus. He chose Mary. But the rest of us, we have no opportunity to choose family, isn't it? But just like you chose a university, you also have an opportunity to choose the company that you keep. Are we together? Scripture emphasizes the importance of the fellowship of believers. And says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. Because there were some people, I think, who were not meeting for fellowship. Why does scripture say that? It's because scripture understands the Lord knows that the company you keep will define how you walk. If I had time, I would tell you my own testimony. I tell it often enough. You'll hear it definitely before you complete your studies here. Because you see, keeping together, the people that you keep together with, eventually kind of form a culture around you. And you start speaking of the same things. You start behaving of the same things. You start going to places that are similar. You start being together. And before you realize it, they have become a habit for you. It's very simple. And I know that in my, as a young person, my life habits and many things, both good and bad that I got, I got mostly through the company that I kept. So, the psalmist says here, one of the most important influences in verse 1, blessed is the man who does not do what? Seek counsel. Who walks not in, in the counsel of the wicked. Nor stands in the way of sinners. Nor sits in the seat of scoffers. The whole thing that the psalmist is actually talking about is just company. That beware who you are with. Now, by the way, when I'm saying this, we are not saying that you should somehow separate yourself and become a hermit. That's not the point here. But you need to be very careful. When people are telling lies, when people are slandering, when people are doing things that are wrong, and you're just smiling to keep company. You know what is happening to you? You are slowly being changed. So it's not counsel that comes directly. And may I say to you, my brothers and sisters, it also matters what church you go to. It matters what church you go to. If you want to go to Bujingo's church, you can go to Bujingo's church. But I can tell you for sure, you have chosen the venom of a snake. You see, one assumption that many young people make is to think that wherever the name of Jesus is mentioned is actually godly. Or to make the mistake to think that when I talk about company, the company that you should not walk with, that company never comes to church. No, that company is also in church. And sometimes it is pastor. It's called a pastor or bishop or whatever. 
The psalmist says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. It does not say the wicked who does not come to church. It does not say the sinner that does not come to church. It is saying that the wicked is someone you need to be watchful about and keep your company right. Are you with me, friends? He said, I don't have enough time, so I'm not going to say much. If he was... If the psalmist, if I were to paraphrase what the psalmist says, uh, it's like he's saying to us, blessed is the man who does not walk in fellowship with the wicked. Now, it becomes very obvious when we say that, if you don't walk in fellowship with the wicked, what is the Bible recommending? Isn't it clear? Self-evident. That the fellowship that you keep whether it is out there or it is in the university or it is in the fellowship, in the churches that you like going to, blessed is the man who does not walk in fellowship with the wicked. Blessed is the man who does not keep company with evil people. Now I must hasten to my next point, which he talks about. So he's told us to shun that. But what does he say in verse 2? But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he made tests day and night. You see, the first, the influencer of company, he cautions us. And you see, it doesn't matter what company you keep. The company you keep, will eventually, you will eventually look like your company. That's what you need to understand. And by the way, if I would stretch that a little bit better, a little bit further... Because of what I said earlier. It also matters who you marry. Because you could become the son-in-law or daughter-in-law of Satan. I will leave that one there for you to take away. Now let me go to the second point that he makes for us. The influence of what you are preoccupied with. What are you preoccupied with? Yeah? The influence of your preoccupation. If I were to ask you, what is your first activity when you wake up? Social media? Facebook? You know, there are some of us who wake up like the phone is going to die if we don't open it. That's the day and age we are living in, isn't it? All of a sudden, you just feel like, I must check it. Do you know what the phone is doing to you? It is influencing you in a certain direction. That you can never leave it anywhere. The phone has become so essential that it actually owns us. You think you own the phone, but actually you own it. It owns you. Do you realize that? I see people when I go for my, my morning walks to the sports field, there are people who can't leave their phones. Why do you need it? I can't go with it. I've gone to do exercise. If the people want to call, let them call. I'll come back, I'll catch up. But you know, we live in an age where we are influenced by everything else but God's word. And what does the psalmist say? On his word, he meditates day and night. The influencers of your pre preoccupation. If I were to ask you, do you miss God's word when you do not read it through the, throughout the day? Do you actually miss it? You get out, you don't read it, you go through the day. If you were to lose your Bible, would you miss it? There are people who wouldn't, by the way. There are people who wouldn't. Yeah? Do you miss it? Do you miss it when you do not hear it preached from the pulpit? 
or you don't even know when the Bible is pre being preached, whether the Bible is being preached or not. Do you miss it? I mean, I, I am old enough to say I have heard, I have heard someone's, even someone's where the Bible is never engaged with. A one hour sermon, and someone is actually telling me that he's preaching. For me, if I don't hear the word, forget it. Go away. I have had sermons of people who just stand up to make people laugh. I'm not saying being interesting is not good. But what does the psalmist say? He says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he may text day and night. Preoccupied with it day and night. Time is against me. Let me just give you this quote as I shut up. And I like this quote. Unfortunately, it was written by the most famous author in the world. Unfortunately. Do you know who the most famous author is? He's called Anonymous. And it says, a Bible that is worn out and falling apart from use usually belongs to someone who isn't. In other words, a Bible that is, being, that is torn, tattered, and all that usually belongs to someone who is not falling apart. Are we together? You know, I remember when I went to Australia, 1980, early that year. And in Uganda here, there were no Bibles, no new Bibles to purchase. So the Bible that I took, I, I took with myself, I had, I had bought it in Nairobi as a student. And I had read it from cover to cover again and again. I had meditated on it. I had memorized out of it. I had done everything. And honestly, I was just holding it together. But that would tell you my life was not falling apart. But if you don't read your Bible, if you don't meditate on God's word, you will be influenced. Don't, don't deceive yourself. It's not like you won't get something else to influence you. You will have other things to influence you. Some of us are influenced through the preacher. So we think we hear the word from the preacher. And so we just want to be able to listen to what the preacher says. And we hear the word through the preacher. We never take time to meditate on it. A Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to a person who isn't. May God bless you.